I thought I had it all planned. In my journey through life, hustling on the corner, breaking night, making fast money, but what was it worth? Addicted to the streets, I think I've been cursed. Dreams of getting rich and going legit, but all I see in my future is this jail-ish. I'm lost. I'm trying to find my path, but every time I do, I get lured by this demon called cash. How long will this battle of good and evil in me last? I don't know. I don't know. But I do know I've got to make a decision fast because time just seems like it's going by in a flash. And I need to realize that this life on the streets, it's not all I have. That poem was written by Jay, and Jay was a young man who I knew who lived at Rikers Island. He's one of the many young men that I met in my 10 years in and out of prisons. Now, I haven't been in and out of prisons for 10 years because I've committed a crime, but I have committed my life to standing in solidarity with men and women who are or have been incarcerated. And that's because it's deeply personal to me from people in my family or friends who I know who have been incarcerated to people who look like me who are overrepresented in our prisons to the injustices I've seen, it's kind of a hard issue to ignore. But Jay was a young man who was trying to get himself out of a bad situation and into a better place. And he went through a lot of challenges. And I can relate to that because my parents went through a lot of challenges as well. My parents are immigrants from Haiti and they came to the United States looking for their American dream. They thought that if they came here, they would have a lot more opportunities, more opportunities that they could get from anywhere else, especially for their children. And one of those opportunities was education. And my parents were really, really serious about education. So much so that in first grade, my teacher told my parents that I talked too much in class. Now, I didn't really believe that, but if you know Caribbean parents, they usually believe the teacher and not the kid. So they devised this whole system by which every day I would come home with a little index card and on it would read my conduct. And it would say either good, fair, or poor. And you can better believe that after that I tried to straighten up because I was not trying to feel my parents' wrath around this. So education was just a given and in fact, Going to college was just assumed. It wasn't about if I was going to college, it was just about where I was going to college. And for many of us, that's the case, right? But in my 15 years as a college educator, I found that there are definitely groups of people for which going to college is not an inevitability, for which in their community there is no college-going culture. And one of those groups of people happens to be people who are incarcerated. In fact, people who are incarcerated have been called the most educationally disadvantaged group, disenfranchised group in the United States. Now notice I keep saying people who are incarcerated and not prisoner or criminals or inmates. I'm really intentional about my language because language is really important and labels are really important. And in this country, we like to label people so that we can further put them in a box. So for the next several minutes, I invite us to think about people who are incarcerated as people. As people who may have the same wants and desires that we do. People who might make poor decisions just like we do. People who should have the same access to opportunities as we do. And one of those opportunities is higher education. Think about this, if you are incarcerated in the United States and you don't have a high school diploma, in many states it's actually mandatory for you to take classes in prison to work towards your GED. So that's a given, right? So shouldn't that be the same for higher education? Well, let's think about it. The United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, in Article 26, it says that higher education should be accessible to all on the basis of merit. And we were actually one of the countries that helped draft the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So to me, it says we value that as a right, not just a privilege. But let's juxtapose that with our 13th Amendment, our own Constitution. Our 13th Amendment abolished slavery except in the instance when someone is convicted of committing a crime. I'm gonna say that again. Our 13th Amendment abolished slavery except in the case when someone is convicted of committing a crime. 
Now that's a small loophole that's allowed us to disenfranchise millions of people over time. Think about it this way. Would you want your access to higher education taken away because you made a poor decision or you made a mistake? Probably not. But I think that higher education should be a right. But our country isn't there yet. Instead, we are in the middle of a crisis. And that crisis is called the prison industrial complex. We lock up close to 2.3 million people in this country. And to give you some context around that, we have more people incarcerated in this country than are incarcerated in Russia and China combined. And when you layer on top of that the fact that people of color are disproportionately represented in that system, I would say that we have a crisis. In fact, some people would call this the civil rights issue of our time. But I think that we could change that. I think that we could really change that statistic, and one of the ways that we could do that is through higher education. Because study after study has already shown that people who are incarcerated, who have access to and take advantage of a college education, well, they're less likely to return to prison. And if they're less likely to return to prison, that means there'll be less people in prison. And if there are less people in prison, that means there are more people out in the community, more people back contributing positively to society, impacting their families, perhaps even creating a college-going culture instead of a prison-going culture. I think the reason why we've allowed ourselves to find ourselves in this crisis is because we've stopped being able to think about people who are incarcerated as people. We've brought into all the negative stereotypes and the reality shows, and we think that if we just lock people up and put them somewhere, that we won't have to deal with them again and that we'll be safe. So it's largely about fear. And I get that fear because I once had that fear too. I remember the first time I ever stepped foot in a jail, it was at Rikers Island. And for those of you who are not familiar with Rikers Island, it's located in New York City. It's the second largest jail system in the country. It's comprised of about 10 jails and houses over 12,000 men, women, and young people. And I was going there because my friends and I were going to start an arts program and we were meeting with the principal. So I get to Rikers Island and it's such a large complex that the only way that you can navigate is on a bus, one of those cheese buses, the school buses. So I get on the bus, it's rickety, we're driving around and the driver drops me off on this dirt path that leads to a trailer and the trailer is the school. So I get off, I walk up the path, I put my hand on the doorknob and I turn the doorknob and it's locked. And that's when the panic ensued. Because here I was, in the middle of Rikers Island, of all places, alone, not knowing where I was supposed to go, and all of the negative stereotypes about people who are incarcerated, they started just flooding my mind. Was it irrational? Absolutely. But it happened because I had nothing else to juxtapose it to. Because, you know, eventually I did make it back into that high school, and I did work with some of the young men that were there, and one of them happened to be Jay. And these young men were brilliant. We had an amazing time. We played theater games and we wrote poetry. We talked about hip hop. We talked about the prison industrial complex and their dreams and aspirations around education. And we celebrated every time somebody took a test and got their GED. And I remember very clearly one day we were playing a theater game and one of the teachers came up to me and she was like, oh my God, this is so amazing. I can't believe it. They're acting like teenagers. And I looked at her and I said, well, how else are they supposed to act? They are teenagers. But you see, this is where the negative stereotypes have allowed us to flood our brain and think differently. All we did was offer these young men a creative space. We offered them dignity and respect. And in return, they acted like teenagers. So I get the fear. but. Fear is a false ideology in this case. The idea that if we just lock people up and put them somewhere, we won't ever have to deal with them again is false, totally false. Because the reality is, people who are going into prison, the majority of them will be coming back into our communities. And I say our communities because they are our community members. They aren't some outsiders. These are our sisters, our brothers, our cousins, our next door neighbors, our small business owners. And we should be asking ourselves, how are we going to welcome our community members back into our community? 
How are we going to make sure that they have access to the same American dream that we've all had access to? I think we can do that through higher education. When I was in New York, I had the privilege of helping to start a prison education program. And I remember the first night that we went there um, to hold an information session, and I was filled with anxiety, but not the same kind of anxiety I had when I went to Rikers. This was completely different. I, I was anxious because I didn't know if any of the men would show up. I didn't know if they would think that we had some sort of agenda, um, or if they would see that we were really genuine. And I hoped that maybe 10 or 20 of them would show up. And when I got there, by the time we started, there were over 100 men sitting in that visiting room waiting to hear about the possibility of starting a college program in their facility. And as we started, my dean at the time asked the men a question. He said, what is your understanding of a liberal arts education? And one of the men in the back, he stood up, his name is Daryl. Daryl stood up and he started quoting Dewey. John Dewey. John Dewey, the famous educational philosopher who talked about the intersection of education and social justice, the same John Dewey who had co-founded the institution that we were actually representing. And this launched us into this amazing conversation about education and its benefits. And afterwards, we were fielding questions, and Daryl came up to me and he was like, Miss, Miss, thank you so much for coming. I'm really excited. I'm going to make sure that I hand in my application. And I was like, that's great, Daryl. I can't wait to get your application. And he was like, no, Miss, no, you don't understand. This is, this is really serious. This is important. You have to make sure that you read my application. And I was like, Daryl, I got you. I see that you're here. I'm going to get your app. There's a lot of anxiety. You, all of you who have gone through admissions, you know this, right? <laughs> so I was like, don't worry. I've got you. I know that you're there. We're going to make sure we read your application. And he said, no, miss, no, you don't understand. This is life or death. Life or death. I will never forget what Daryl said to me that day, because in that moment, Daryl and I really understood each other. I understood that a college education for Daryl could completely change his life, as it had changed mine, because when I was in elementary school and high school, I was a bit of an outcast. I was really shy, even though my first grade teacher said I talked a lot in class, but I was actually bullied a lot until I got to college. And in college, that was the place where I got to explore who I was, I got to figure that out, I got to um, delve into my passions. It was the place where I started to figure out what my life's purpose was. And shouldn't everybody have that opportunity? Shouldn't everybody have the opportunity to figure out what their life's purpose is? It was John Dewey who said, education is not preparation for life. Education is life. And so everyone should have that, whether they live in a suburb or an inner city or a prison. All over this country, there is a movement to increase higher education around prisons. And of course, there's been backlash, right? Everything from why should somebody who's incarcerated get a college education to why should we pay for it? But studies already prove that college prison programs reduce recidivism and they save states money by educating rather than incarcerating. So consider this. The state of California spends almost $50,000 to incarcerate just one individual for one year. $50,000. That's a lot of money. I don't know about you, but I could do a lot of stuff with $50,000. <laughs> but let me also tell you what $50,000 can get you. For $50,000, you could send over 12,000 students to a community college for one year. For $50,000, you could send six or seven students to a UC or a Cal State for one year. And for $50,000, you could send one student, like Daryl or Jay, to a liberal arts college for one year. So I really challenge states to think about this, to think about what it would mean to expand higher education and make it accessible for all. Because if we were able to do that, we could radically change what's going on inside our prisons while having a deep, deep impact on what's happening in our communities. And what about us? What can we do? Well, if you're like me and you love TED and TEDx, you probably will go to another TED conference, and you could do that in a prison. Because all over this country, there are TEDx conferences that are sprouting up in prisons, 
And these are spaces where you can hear directly from people who are impacted by this system. You could hear their ideas worth spreading. And I think that's just amazing and powerful. The other thing you can think about is language. That's a small thing, right? What if we all shifted our language and instead of saying prisoner or criminal or inmate, we said man or woman or person who is incarcerated? We could have a dramatic effect on how people think and talk about people who are caught up in our criminal justice system. And then finally, if there's a prison college program in your area, you could support that program. You could tutor in that program. You could teach a class in that program. And that way you could see for yourself just how impactful a college education is to a person. So think about Daryl. Think about the fact that for one person, somebody out there, a college education is the difference between life or death. And so everyone, everyone should have access to that because in my mind, a prison ID should never, ever bar anyone from getting a college ID. Thank you.